It's my great privilege and honor to hand over to Professor Hans Rosling to deliver today's last and concluding remarks. The floor is yours. Welcome and, a, and thank you. And a short one. Thank you very much. I was emotionally touched by Katarina Kiswani's map from Syria. Uh, to see that MSF has been pushed out of Syria, virtually, and that you were in the periphery, though you have done everything to be in the center. I heard that UNICEF tried with another approach, but was also meeting great difficulties. I was also emotionally approached by Mats Karlsson's very clear summary that it's dangerous. What we are seeing today, the reversal of the trend of risky conflicts going down has stopped going down, and it's going up again. I agree completely. Some people have said that I'm an optimist. I'm not an optimist. I just try to observe how things are, and I agree completely that it appears to be very risky. I have the entire day followed the advance of the Iraqi troops into Fallujah, to central Fallujah today. It's a big thing that is happening today. I've been thinking about the people in Fallujah and about the infantry soldiers that have to risk their life to fight this group. Uh, this was my sort of emotional, and it came together from your analytical unit and your action unit, the same thing, that there are things which are really dangerous, which is happening. Now, I have 10 more intellectual reflections I will go over. First, of course, I was impressed by Jan Eliasson's speech. Every sentence was thoughtful and correct, absolutely impressive. And he said, no goal is isolated. He said, the goals are mutually reinforcing. That's a challenge for us. How is the goal that we are working on that actually is our pet goal? How is that enforcing the other goals? And how much are the others enforcing our goal? And in which context is it that our goal, health, is really more in reinforcing the others? And in which setting is it that the others can really reinforce uh, health? I'll come back to that. I think that, that was the intellectual starting point, you know, ground zero intellectual for the day. Ulrika Mudeir went on, and she was quite clear, though very soft-spoken, where she said that, that basic health service generate trust in the population. And trust in the population brings stability. But she was saying, if you can just provide some basic health service, you will create stability. You will, you will contribute with health to the much broader need of stability for all the other aspects. So I was thinking like this, don't ask what stability can do for the health service. Ask what health service can do for stability. That's a little challenge for us that are sort of bragging, I'm a medical doctor, I'm in health, health has a value in itself, it's human right, it's health. No, there are some contexts in which health really, its main importance is to help form the state, to help make a functioning society work. Uh, not all over, of course. The largest part of the world is in either way. But, but I like that, that Ulrika was saying, even if they are mutually reinforcing, one thing can be stronger in one direction than it goes in the other direction. And that's our analytical task to find it. She also referred to the work with international dialogue on peace building and state building where I think we should be very proud that we have Isabella Levine as the representative of the richer end of the world working there. And I was so nervous over the last days when there was a reshuffling in the government uh, that, that we would, that would, for domestic political reasons, she would be taken off that very important international post. I think her international work is more important than anything she can do within Sweden. By the way, what Sweden should be known for after 15 years, I think nothing. We should say we did it together. We should have a world where we do things together. Eh? Not this is we and this have our logo and we did this and we did that. You know? we, should, we, should, we should be more, more of doing it together. And it's a little that what IDPS is about. Eh? It was said today that, that EDPS is drifting away from humanitarianism. Yes, it is, but don't use drifting. They are walking focused away from it. 1993, I arranged a similar meeting in Uppsala. It was called, Is Medicine Sans Frontier Needed in Sweden? After that meeting, Johan von Scheeb took on the task to start Medicine Sans Frontier in Sweden. Even if I did just a very little small thing, I'm very proud. 
because the organization is very good and is doing what it's aimed to do. But today, I feel the same need for this international dialogue for peace building and state building as at, at that time thought that now Medicine Sans Frontiers need. And you're needing still today. You're very good at what you're doing. But for state building, you are not so useful. <laughs> we agree. You're, you're not so useful. So fine, then we agree, then we agree. Huh? So, uh, so what about, what should be in this dialogue? What is it in the fragile war situation that is important for the goals? Well, we have different components, different sectors of society, and then we have the data, we measure each of them. The components, I found it extremely interesting that the word climate has almost not been mentioned today. We had a 45-minute discussion about the war in Syria, and the word climate wasn't mentioned once. Al Gore only talks for 11 seconds until he talks about climate in Syria. We have a problem in the international discourse in the rich countries, is that whatever the problem is, people want to take the thing they work on, their profession areas, and say, oh, this is what's important. It's called climate reductionism. There are even, even academic studies of this amazing manner in which the, those who advocated for action against climate change, of which I'm one of them. Just let me say you that I've done the video for the international panel for climate change, the information video. I am horrified by the potential of climate change in 50 to 100 years from now. It's a long perspective and it's really big risk. But to turn that into short risk, I've had tough discussion with Al Gore twice, where he wanted me to help him to make presentation to create fear. People should be uh, scared about climate change. And he invented the concept climate refugees, which is one of the worst idea of communication, the worst falsification, because they said everyone is scared of refugees. They don't want refugees. So if we tell them that climate change is, it's a very marginal part of the refugees, is climate. One of my dearest colleagues, originally from Somalia, said it used to be all culture, now it's all climate. Yeah. So, so that was interesting. We didn't talk about that today. What other sector didn't we talk about? We didn't talk about the armed forces. That was even said today that from the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Sweden that the crisis in Syria and the Middle East is all about politics. No, it's not. I do not hope that that's an expression that Sweden is going to negotiate a settlement with the Caliphate, with the Islamic State. Is there any plans for making a de facto recognition of the Islamic State? No, they should be beaten. We are depending on Sunni infantry soldiers, their courage, and they are shooting their way into it. And this is a war that has to be won. Then. The other two parts in the Syrian conflict definitely have to be solved politically. But, but being too general, it has to be one country, one solution. Libya is a very dangerous, I think Libya is the most dangerous situation. I am of the impression that the Islamic State will be beaten in Ramadi, in Fallujah, in, in Raqqa and in Mosul at horrifying humanitarian costs and suffering at horrifying cost. But they will be beaten and they will slip over to Libya and they will go down to the Sahel. That, that's it. And we didn't say anything about militaries when we talked about this. It, 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 it's, interesting. it's very interesting what was not said in this meeting and the importance of health and militaries working together. Huh? I had a very humbling experience when I worked for 12 weeks as deputy head of epidemiological surveillance for Ebola in Monrovia, in Liberia, recruited through the UN system by Anders here. And, 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 uh, and I was placed in the Ministry of Health. We didn't manage to have one single day, one epidemiologist from Medicines on Frontier to work with us in the Ministry of Health. Not one single day, they were not allowed. They were very good, they did other good things. Who was it? that who in, what international organization was it that provided people that enforced our team and worked daily together with us? The 101st Airborne Division of the American Army from Kentucky under commanding General Gary Woleski. I'm embarrassed and I'm humbled because I had to change my mind. 
They provided people who knew Excel. We took away all databases, we ran it all in Excel. Uh, and they worked with us daily. They integrated, and the discussion I had with these generals and the colonel, who was a female colonel in the US Army, really uh, with, with a PhD on state building and gender. She was just absolutely amazing. You know? And we sat and looked at the strategy of Ebola merging with, with uh, Boko Haram, how that situation was, uh, and why we should put the laboratories to stop that from happening. So, so we didn't talk about that. We talked a lot about gender and women and girls, and that's a very important thing. But it was a little as if I had been at Stockholm Resilience Center, they would talk about climate and crisis. It's not only about gender issues. Here, here. I dare say that. There are some countries that perhaps you should not mention the word sexuality when you solve it. Take, for instance, Yemen. If you are going to make a negotiation between Sunni and Shia and that, perhaps you have to withdraw a little with that demand in in the actions over the next one to two absolutely crucial years. Because if we don't bring peace to Yemen, it's very, very dangerous, what I'm saying. Very, very dangerous, because that's the connection between the Middle East and the rest of the collapsed uh, countries, fragile states in Africa. One has to be pragmatic. That's what, what I like Isabella Levine saying, one country, one plan. It's not about having your thing implemented all over. That's not how we solve this. You have to be extremely pragmatic. Extremely pragmatic. Eh? So we talked about climate. We, talked, we talk, didn't talk about climate. We didn't talk about army. We didn't talk about infrastructure. Beside the wonderful photo from MSF of the bridge. Yeah, yeah infrastructure. It's on the Rhone stones in Sweden. A thousand years ago. Stone built bridge. You know, the one who built the bridge. That was what integrated that community into the country. Yeah? And it's so important infrastructure. So we took up in this meeting one aspect which is very important, and I would agree the most important today, gender issue, but it's not the only one. It's absurd that we didn't talk about the other ones with, with some sort of linkage. And that's what was the demand from John, Ulrika and Isabel for us to have this, how they are mutually reinforcing, instead of just having our own thing. Jerke Lillisan also mentioned one thing which was very interesting. He said traffic injuries. You cannot, within health, just promote maternal health. You cannot have a basic health service that only do cesarean sections and take care of delivery service with blood transfusion. You have to take care of the traffic accidents. And mind you, traffic accidents are very gender it's a big gender issue because women are walking along the road and men are driving dangerous vehicles and they are hit or they fall off the vehicles, you know, and they need treatment for that. But that's not in the concept of it, because it's just broken legs, which are terrible and which are lethal if you don't do it. Huh? So it's very impo important also that we in health that we are pragmatic. And if you want to have trust in a remote place, if you can take care of shotguns, wounds, as you had MSF was doing, in the first, when you put service in a, in a war situation and the traffic accident. And then you had to build on the cesarean sections and so on. But you cannot just go in and do that one thing which you like most. You have to be pragmatic in this situation. This was about the component. Now data. Are we using data? We heard 60% today, or 63%. Did you hear that? 63% or 60% of the maternal deaths were in humanitarian situation. Bullshit. Everyone who knows something intuitively about global health knows that that number is wrong. There's no way that 200,000 out of 300,000 maternal deaths in this world are in, in, in war situation, in fragile situation. Helena did a very fast, and she found out the UNFPA report that generated the number. And she found out that they had used OECD's definition of fragile state, because it's 50, though they say it's 35, and that couldn't be found, the good reference of it. Anyhow, they include Bangladesh, Pakistan, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And there are so many tragic and unacceptable maternal deaths in those four countries that has nothing to do with conflict or nothing to do with fragility, just extreme poverty, which still has to be solved. In order to try to merge maternal health concern 
and concerns about fragility more than it should be merged. It's not at all that overlap. It's probably 15% only. And that's accepted and repeated because the number is not generated for analytical purpose and for wise action. It's just generated for communication. It's just generated for advocacy. Nothing else. We have had this discussion and, 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 and you were nervous about what you should call the world. Just see that we have to divide into four groups. We cannot have middle-income countries any longer. There are five billion people. Helena showed this morning that the biggest difference in the world in health is between lower middle-income countries and upper middle-income countries. That's where maternal deaths fall very low down. That's where, where, where infections are getting controlled. That's why child mortality falls down. And then we have all the other challenges in the health systems in the upper middle income countries eh? with antibiotic resistance being developed uh, very harshly in this there's so many problems there but the big difference is there we can have the world in four groups or instead of saying developing world you could say all around the world we had the example now of health system in us where people had to sell their house to treat their cancer and then we heard that it's also like that in low and middle income countries. No, it's that all around the world, except in few lucky welfare states that are both rich and have a decent health system. There it doesn't exist. So, so it's take away the idea that there are two. Take away that idea. We have another structure. We can analyze data better. Next point about data. We heard from Anneli Berholm Söder, very honest, very, very frank presentation. And she said, we thought we had a functioning system for receiving asylum seekers in Sweden. How could anyone think that? How could anyone seriously have that idea? When Sweden signed in 1958 the Geneva Convention and the 1967 extension in the New York protocol that every person in the world who have uh, the need for asylum have the right to get it in Sweden and in other countries in the European Union. Uh, Turkey did not sign that because they said, oh, we can't do that. So Turkey today do not break any of their laws. They haven't signed it. And how could we have that? Saying that everyone in the world with the number of refugees increasing, increasing over the years and the decades by this subtle cynical transport obstacle. We gradually introduce systems so that those who have the right to asylum cannot reach the soil where they can have it. We forbid people to apply at the embassy, what Raoul Wallenberg did in Budapest, that's not allowed. And you, cannot, you have no chance, you have to get here physically to exercise your right. And we have the, the, the law against smuggling of people. So someone who has a relative who is in Germany as a refugee and go and fetch them, the, the, the relative will have the right to asylum, but they will be punished by law for fetching them. It's a cynical illusion. And I've read now very good studies from Turkey, from the legal expert, one, one at, at the Turkish university, who showed, uh, she showed already 2008 that this was an illusion. Sweden and other European countries have been living with an illusion that they exercise the right for asylum. And it was only built on that, that no one should afford this. We made it so costly. Then came the war in Syria, the tragedy we've seen. And so many people who were relatively well off and who had the money, they could pay the 80,000 Swedish crowns it cost to get here, or the 50,000, depending on which way they choose. And then they came here and they presented their case. And then we realized, eh? but the numbers overwhelmed us. Yes, because we have never calculated. We have never calculated. And there's one political representative in Sweden eh? who we gave the monopoly on this truth, which I think was a big mistake. And he has said, hur i helvete ska det vara så jävla svårt att det fråga om antal? I won't translate it into English. It's uh, too painful for us. Too painful for us. You know, it's just about the number coming. And when the number and people were able to come and exercise the rate, we have to change it. This is seen from outside. People see this around the world. And they see this as, yes, this is the rich countries who have the moral and so on, but they can't afford to exercise it. 
They want to pretend they are more moral than they actually have. And then at the same time, we have underfunded severely UNHCR. What Gunbrit said about the Palestinian refugees were very interesting. How they could have a decent life, although they were refugees, they could have health service, they could have training, but they were few. And they got 10 times more in ODA per person than anyone else in this world. And there's no way we could afford that cost, but it could have been done a little similar. Instead of giving UNHCR last year the 25 Swedish crowns they asked per refugee, they got 10. And we used 500 per asylum seeker in Sweden per day, and we tried to cut it from aid money. But that was stopped wisely by the government at 30%. But money had been cut from UNICEF, from UNFPA, from Gavi over the last years to cover these costs. This is about using numbers. But when we focus on morale, we don't use numbers. Now, Anders showed us from Sierra Leone, now you only have one third of the uh, maternal mortalities covered when you use the Ebola approach. And that's the problem. That's the problem because, because you won't get them until you have a service. You won't, you won't get, you might need to have some sort of service and then they will come out. But it's a good start. Eh? So, so, so using numbers, we have to start with ourselves. And I, 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 I'm, I'm excited by the idea of sight. But I think that's a crucial decision to make there. Should there be advocacy experts, really? There are so many experts on advocacy here. We don't need more experts on that. I think we need experts that check those who do advocacy. We need audits for those who do advocacy. That's what we need. I, I know that you are working on this. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a work in progress. But, but where, should, where is the biggest need now? Is it to really present the objective best knowledge we have for those who do advocacy? Or is it doing the advocacy? Well, it's given us, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not. It's not. Well, then, uh, then we need... Uh, we cut our presentation short. No, but... It. It's obviously not only advocacy. No, it's not. It's not. But I, I, I would just try to... I see more and more need for what you are proposing the more it goes to the objective facts. Eh? I think we have global Utman, we have lots of think tanks, and, and they are doing good jobs. We need that it's more correct what they are saying. Finally, Ebola. Maybe we talk too much about Ebola. Maybe we try to make too much example about Ebola. Helena used to say, Ebola isn't that contagious. It's not that contagious. It doesn't help us so much fighting malaria, holding that. We have little to do. It was dramatic. Even for us who were involved with it, it was even more dramatic. But it can be used in the country context, eh? because people got very serious. We saw national professionals and, and leaders who had it. So it's not Ebola as a disease, but it's the experience of it that can be used. Eh? Uh, I have at the end, I have at the end, Cypris, Don Smith's words. He said something, I'm a little emotional at the end also. He said, apartheid came to a peaceful end. Who would have believed that? Who would have believed that? Uh, US and China started to talk to each other. And so far, so good. Now we don't know what is coming. But it seems the problem is more on the US side than on the Chinese side when I'm nervous now. So what is it we have to do? My only slide I will show you. This is a district, one of your district in Sierra Leone one in northern Nigeria, one in Yemen, you know. It looks like this, a district. It's about uh, 300,000 people or something like that in it. Huh? There's a river passing it like that. There's a road passing it like that. And you know where the district center is? It's there, where the road hit the river. This is in a fragile country. It's a very poor rural area. Huh? That's a little hospital there, there's a health center there, there's a health center there, there's a little road there, and there is a little road there with a the health center. Where do the people in extreme poverty live? Where is the problem? It's there, 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 and there. Those corners, that's where it is. That's from where Boko Haram came and came down, and those secondary school girls who were there, that's where they, they were taken away in this brutal, terrible way. That is still painful for every one of us who think about it. That from the corner up there is from where Ebola came and started to spread before it was discovered. We can't have those corners. 
We can't have those corners, and we can't let those corners fall into, into armed bands and fanatic people. And how that is solved, that will be special for every country. This is very geographical. Instead of just dealing with numbers, I think we have to have maps. We have to map where this security problem is. Where are the births taking place? Where are children vaccinated? Where are the unvaccinated children? And to go the last way, to reach the last 15% now, is not easy. There's no automatic continuation of this. Uh, to vaccinate the lost children, to have that health service to function where there is no bridge, where there's no infrastructure, that's extremely challenging. So this is, this is what the world needs to come together. But for me, it's not so much humanitarian, because this is self-interest. I don't want my grandkids to live in a world with a big caliphate. I don't want my, my, my grandkids to live in a world where Ebola runs free and other infectious diseases come off. It's common interest. That's what's good with the SDG. It's a common interest. It's a cross-border, which you wanted to have in the site, a cross-border issues. And even the most fragile state, it's of our self-interest to see that they become stable, those countries, that those people get a decent life. So that's the big challenge, and that must be based on fact and analysis. We cannot just work on advocacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you. We're hereby closing the day. Thank you. Thank you.